often, every female rock musician has had to answer a predictable question. What's it like being a girl in a band? Rock and roll is supposed to be a place where you can be what you want to be. But history suggests that rock bands are not equal opportunities employers. For many, the sight of a girl shredding a guitar or laying into the drums is still a bit of a novelty. Since the birth of the rock and roll band, boys have spent hours tinkering on their Les Pauls, while girls are merely the object of the songs, or so the story goes. As soon as women stepped across the line and formed their own bands, they were given labels. The rock chick. The girl band. One half of the rock and roll couple. And sometimes just the other one. I wanted to meet the women who crossed the line, formed bands and tried to go their own way. If you want to do something, just do it. Don't talk about it. And don't criticize other women. If, if, if they want to go out, you know, and swing on a wrecking ball naked, why not? They related to the world on their own terms. We don't understand how men stand with our legs wide open, our guitar right down there, like we've got great big heavy bollocks hanging down. They followed the magnetic pull of the rock and roll lifestyle. You're going to meet the biggest rock stars. You're going to play the biggest venues and tour the world. I was like, wow, I, I got to tell my mom. There is the predictable. It always used to be get your tits out, basically. The photographer was going, if you just open your legs a bit and kind of le and I was like, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie! <laughs> Imagine our surprise. I was like, oh, they love us. <laughs> These are the untold stories from half a century on Rock's front line. I want to discover, has it always been different for the girl in a band? Before the modern concept of the rock and roll band took shape in the late 1950s, you could try and join a jazz band. But playing in smoky LA clubs was considered no place for a lady. I'm here to meet someone who muscled in on that world and became an exception to the rule. This is the story of the invisible woman, the girl who ended up the number one cool player in the session band that played on some of the biggest records of the 20th century. Was it unusual for a girl to be playing guitar? Well, you know what? I didn't think of it. I started to hear this bebop jazz on, on the radio, and I said, that's what I want to play. The teenage Carol cut her teeth as a jazz guitarist in clubs around Los Angeles, and being the only girl in the band meant she often had to stand her ground. There's always one guy in every band that's going to test you. You have to get the whole band to laugh at them. You know, in other words, repeat back to them what they say. You know, like, like this one one guy that said, "Oh, you're you're. I mean, you're you're a dumb cunt, Carol." I said, "Well, you're a dumb prick too." You know. Undeterred by the cat calling, Carol carried on playing around LA's jazz clubs until she caught the ear of record producer Bumps Blackwell, who asked her to play guitar on "Summertime" for the legendary Sam Cooke. Summertime. It wasn't long before Richie Valens came calling. And as the jazz clubs around LA began to close, Carol began making money from the new music of the time, rock and roll, playing guitar for artists like Dwayne Eddy and Chris Montez. You're talking about one dollar, two dollar, three dollar. I love rock and roll. <laughs> Five dollars, six dollars. Jazz? What's that? The spirit of it was how to create a hit record with a simple little line. See, that, that was the challenge. And was that a challenge that was given to you from the start? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you, you, if you didn't create a hit line, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't work next year. Carol was now in demand as a bass player, and next up she entered the Wall of Sound, working on songs for Phil Spector and some of his main draws, like the Righteous Brothers. Tell me about meeting and working with Phil Spector. 
We all thought he was kind of weird. And he would kid with the musician. Pretty soon, he started kidding pretty hard. And he'd pick on him a little bit. And thought, hey, this did stuff. he ever pick on you? He did one time. I told him to F off or something like that. Did you ever come across surprise from people being brought in just to do vocals and, and the pop records that you were a female player? And Frank Sinatra, he was kind of like standoff. He's just like, oh, I got a woman on the day. You know, but they were all cool. And then I go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like I love you. After proving herself to the Rat Pack, Carol helped a certain beach boy shape his musical vision. I'm picking up good vibrations. She's giving me the excitations. I got along with Brian very well. I was like an older sister to him. He brought in his parts that weren't written very well, you know, so you knew that he was not schooled in music. Sharps and flats on the wrong side of the note, stems on the wrong side of the note, you know, so sometimes you had to recopy the bass parts. Carol Kay played on over 10,000 sessions and laid down some of the 60s most famous bass lines, from Glen Campbell's Wichita Lineman to Simon and Garfunkel's Homeward Bound. Despite her huge success, she was always a lone pioneer who constantly had to defend her unique position in the session business. In 1964, a band of Liverpudlian teenagers struck out to find fame amid the exotic delights of Hamburg's Reaper Barn. The kids couldn't get enough of the Fab Four. Val, Mary, Sylvia and Pam were the liver birds. They were part of the Mersey Beat scene. It wasn't only Scylla who found success working in the Cavern Club. Alongside the Beatles, the Liver Birds were chosen to play at Hamburg's famous Star Club. It's there that I met up with them to talk about the reaction they got when they formed their all-girl rock and roll band in the early 1960s. This is all the groups that played here? Yeah. Where are you? We're right next to the Beatles. Oh, there you are. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Tell me what made the Hamburg scene so different from the Liverpool scene? In them days, it was the dream of every group to come to play in Hamburg. Mm. If you went back to uh, Liverpool or wherever you came from and you had the Star Club sticker on your guitar case, it meant that you had achieved something. The Star Club may have been the rock and roll mecca to all up and coming bands, but being nestled in Hamburg's infamous Reaper Barn made for an eye-opening experience for these good Catholic girls. When you arrived here in Hamburg, you were 18 and 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did yeah. you make of the Reaper Barn? Oh, truck. <laughs> <laughs> and the taxi dropped us off at the side street. And all I seen, because all I was interested in them days was church. Oh, God, there's a big <laughs> church. And then we went round the corner and seen all the strip clubs. We couldn't believe us. <laughs> It was such an unusual group. I mean, you dressed a little bit like boys. How did you decide what you were going to look like? We only had males that could influence us, and we wanted to look like them as well. How do people react to a group with all girls on guitars? We were only rehearsing at the time, and we went into the dressing room. There's John Lennon and Paul McCartney getting changed, and John Lennon says, what's this, girls with guitars? I bet you that never works out. Proving Lennon wrong, the Liver Birds found success in Germany. In fact, they never returned to England and played on until 1967 when they were still one of the club's main draws. So was it now becoming acceptable for girls to start rock bands? Psychedelia blossomed across America, producing dazzling front women like Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane and Janis Joplin. If you were a girl in the late 1960s and you wanted to pick up a guitar, there was pretty much only one frame of reference. You had to play like a man. The first all-girl rock band to be given a major label record deal in the US were called Fanny.
when we got to California in 1961, it was all about acoustic guitars in the entire world. We knew of no other young women or girls who were playing electric. I mean, we were very confident because we knew we could play. That really is what separated us maybe from a lot of people who wanted to do it, even boys. We were a lot better than a lot of boys that we ran into. But we played the Fillmore East, we played the Fillmore West, we played with the Kinks, the Procol Harum, and we we just done so much, we were in the circle. And um, I think they were all pretty thrilled to have us come in, you know, these chicks who could play. And when a band called Fanny started writing songs, their lyrics tapped into the sexually liberated spirit of the age. It was just a complete lifestyle change that was moving with society, with civil rights, with feminism that was coming, but we didn't know it, you know? We were with the times, and it was just this little sliver that opened up, and boom, we just went right through. Back to Fanny, who've been conquering male chauvinist hearts everywhere. Was there amusement in the UK press at the name Fanny when you came out? You know, I don't even remember who broke it to us, what Fanny means in, in the UK, but it just seemed really funny to us. Fanny! 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 <laughs> Imagine our surprise. I was like, oh, they love us. Forty years later, and June's now running a school of rock for girls, using her experiences to show the next generation what to expect from the business. So tell us about this IMA rock camp that you set up for girls. What I'm doing is I'm giving back, because I feel like I was really lucky. Even though when I left Fanny, people didn't understand. I needed to find something else to you feed. You didn't understand why you were leaving? Yeah. I barely understood. My body just broke down because I was so tired. But I didn't want to leave, but my body just said, hey, you're done. So when I talk about the music biz to the girls, I'm not telling them, you should go out and become a star. What I tell them is, it's a lot harder to be a star than you think. Britain, Elkie Brooks seemed to be the perfect singer on the 60s pop circuit. These lonely nights are getting so hard to bear. But for some reason, the decade never quite sat right with her. She transformed herself into a smouldering blues rock siren. found her musical home alongside Robert Palmer in the band Vinegar Joe. She thought they would last forever, but it wasn't so easy with two lead singers pulling on the reins. There was quite a transformation from 60s Elkie to the amazing rock chip. I just loved it. It just seemed very natural for me. It just progressed in Vinegar Joe to more of a raunchy look. Did you feel that you were fitting quite naturally into that more sexy image? Yeah, I suppose it was quite, you know, a little bit of rebellion in me. I've always had that. quite unusual to have a male and female singing in tandem like that, vying off each other. I hated being on my own so much in the 60s. And you were happier in the band dynamic, oh, is that right? It. Yeah. I loved it. You had a 
great chemistry with Robert on stage. I thought he was marvellous, wonderful, wonderful singer, and oh, incredible looking. He was a wonderful looking man. I think I sang with him rather than he sang with me. So Melody Maker made you the face of 1973. What was the reaction to that? Face of 73, yeah. No, Robert wasn't very happy about that. Because we, and in actual fact, as I found out later, were only supposed to be Robert Palmer's backing band. But of course, the press picked up on me, and uh, that wasn't the way it was supposed to go. Oh, lady of the rain. He was just bitter about it, because obviously he was jealous that they hadn't picked up on him. In some kind of harmony, the shadows you see. How did the band come to an end? Well, uh, quite simply, Robert said that he was leaving the band and uh, Vinegar Joe was no more. We um, did our last gig, I think, in March 1974. How did you feel when it finished? Devastated, really. Um, didn't really know what to do. And for months, I would sit and put all the old press cuttings together in a scrapbook, you know. I was very much still living in the past. It was difficult mm. for me to pick up, my, pick myself up and do something else. Pearl's a singer. She stands up when she plays the piano. Within three years, Elkie found she was better standing on her own two feet. How do you feel about Vinegar Joe now? I really have put it down to experience. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. It's made me the person I am today. Things were changing. Suddenly everyone wanted to see women in bands. Record executive Mickey Most had masterminded Susie Quattro's career and Susie became a big influence on The Runaways. I met up with guitarist Lita Ford. Can't stay at home, can't stay in school. Old folks say... Lita looks back on her time in the band and remembers the call she got from LA impresario Kim Fowley, luring her with the promise of rock and roll when she was just a teenager. Hello. Daddy, hello, Mom. Mom, you're ch 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 I gotta tell my mom. What did Kim teach you about being in a band? He would teach us how to talk, how to sit, how to stand. Don't wear that sweater. Wear something in black that's low cut. He would tell us, don't wear that. Put on some high heels. Like, Kim, she's 15 years old. Why would you want her to wear high heels? Because she's sexy because she's jailbait you know and don't talk to me that way i'm the boss here you don't tell me what to do when you were in the studio with kim and he would call you dog meat or dog shit did that yeah. have any effect on your confidence not really to say the word hey you piece of shit it was like yes kim you know i took it more with a grain of salt Despite Fowley's verbal abuse, the band got to experience mass adulation from their teenage fans as they toured Japan. When we got off the plane, there were thousands of people in the airport. They had to hold a human barricade back so the girls could walk between. After the huge success in Japan, it seemed Fowley's rap about being the biggest band in the world might have paid off until things started to go wrong. When did you first realize that the group might not last? 
Well, Cherie quit awfully fast. She was dating the assistant manager, Scott, and uh, he ended up getting her pregnant at 16, which, you know, being in a rock band, it's not like you're home with mom and dad. And we didn't want to break up the band. Our only option was for Joan to sing. You had the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle when you were so young. What would you change if you could go back? <clears throat> there was a, cu a couple of us um, that were violated sexually that I would change. Had I have known and had I have seen it coming, I would have definitely done something to prevent that. I, mean, I wasn't raped, and I didn't know Jackie was. I hate that she was. I never knew until now. Those are the things that actually make me sick. And that shouldn't have happened, motherfuckers. I'll a kiss. Oscar Wilde, Ja lives, Mr. Thorpe. The time is now. The time is now. But not every girl in rock was suffering at the hands of a manipulative male manager. In 1975, an androgynous, liberated rock star appeared out of nowhere. Patti Smith changed things forever for girls in rock bands. Whether you'd grown up in CBGBs, or Ferry Hill Working Men's Club. In 1976, there wasn't any punk in the Durham pit town where the teenage Pauline Murray lived. So she formed her own band, Penetration, and brought punk to Ferry Hill. What was it like being a punk in Ferry Hill in Durham? The general public of where we lived, I mean, it was a totally different culture. It was the workmen's club culture. The men were men, the women were women. Most people didn't like to stand out because they would be worried about what other people thought of them, a very close-knit community. Everyone knew what everyone was doing. So when we started to go out and do things with the band, obviously people would discuss it and we did get chased or we did get a brick through our window, um, but nothing we couldn't handle. What was the reaction in your family to the name of the band? They thought it was a bit of a laugh, not that their neighbours did. You know, um, I remember we went to Dundee and my dad had a a t-shirt, a homemade t-shirt that said penetration. Uh, and we got out of the car and an old lady over the road shouted, Granda Punk. And he, I think he quite liked it. Did you ever feel that you were being treated differently by the other guys in the band because you were female? I, I actually did just feel like one of the boys. What were your aspirations when you got into a punk band? What did you hope for? It was about doing something creatively new whilst operating almost outside of the system, if that's at all possible. And, it, and we did for a little while operate outside of the system. Pauline and other girls were part of punk right from the start, and female artists continued to fight for space in the scene, gradually bagging record deals. If Pauline found that changing attitudes in a small northern town was a big ask, you'd think that life as a punk in London might have been easier. 
but as one Londoner discovered, opposition was everywhere. You're a typical girl. You tried out being in a band with Sid Vicious. That didn't work. Then you find your musical soulmates. You terrify the boys. The skinheads want to physically hurt you. But you've got a vision, a manifesto, in fact. And playing live is being on the front line. So you're going to have to be absolutely fearless. The Slits lived in a very violent time, you know, 76, 77. It was, it was very scary on the streets. We, we had to go everywhere together as a group of three or four because the way we were dressed was so alien to the times that men everywhere found us incredibly threatening, and skinhead girls and teddy girls. We would be attacked physically, verbally. Ari got stabbed twice in the street. I mean, she was 15 years old. Yeah, we were often running for our lives. The infamous Slits a much-publicised all-girl band who've never actually made a record. Indeed, they've refused offers from several record labels. Undeterred by the violence, the Slits remained united. They didn't want to sell out. After all, punk was about doing things on their own terms. I had a vision, you know, we're going to change things for girls, we're going to change things for music. Um, you know, we, we weren't just going and playing gigs, we're doing something very new. We were absolutely driven. We spend months and months discussing how should we stand on stage because we don't want to stand how men stand with our legs wide open, our guitar right down there, like we've got great big heavy bollocks hanging down or something. We even talked about not using breathy little girl voices, which a lot of women sang in back then. Um, you know, I said, always sing like you're shouting across a playground at a mate. And actually, a girl's voice isn't that different to a boy's voice when you're going, Oi, John! <laughs> When you imagine the Slits audience when you're up there on stage, I mean, how important was it to you that boys were there as well as girls? I said, I want us to be a band that boys want to be in and a gang that boys want to be in and wear clothes that boys want to copy. I mean, of course, girls. We were there for girls mostly. But also wanted to just show guys that we were equally as cool. Brits were driven. One girl who came out of the New York punk scene was a little bit more reticent. You may find yourself in a beautiful house. Growing up, Tina Weymouth always wanted to be a boy. However, she didn't particularly want to be in a band. It took her boyfriend, Chris France, ages to persuade her to join Talking Heads. David Byrne made her audition three times. Nobody played the bass, so that was her job. She drove them to gigs, cut their hair, and gave them her last sandwich. However, what she describes as a sideline role quickly proved to be crucial. Which is on fire. On fire. So tell me a bit about your early meetings with the band, with Talking Heads. I mean, obviously you were in a relationship with Chris at that point. I was. It was Chris's idea to form this band. But it took two years for me to enter into it. Why was that? I just thought that it was too difficult, you know? I just thought, I'm just going to be up against... 